soon. We look forward to seeing you. All right, it looks like people do remember. That really was, Rhonda says she had a great time. Thanks, Rhonda, we appreciate that. So I think that that's one of the big takeaways we really try to um, emphasize in Kaleidoscope. But what I'd like to do now is tell you a little story. Actually, it's kind of a long story. Um, it's a three year long story for work that has been done at a national level, uh, but I think that it's important for you to have a quick historical overview of how we got to where we are and how um, we got to the KSSEs. So again, three years. So what happened is we um, were invited back in 2017 to attend a Service Coordination Leadership Institute that was offered through the um, Early Childhood Personnel Center in Connecticut. And so we attended two years, 2017 and 2018. And from that, we formed this group that's called National Service Coordination Training Work Group. And during that act, those activities, when we were in Connecticut, there were um, work plans and, whoops, hang on just a second, I hit the wrong button. And we actually came up with two subgroups that had really big tasks because we felt very committed to what we wanted to do with service coordination as an entity that really did not have a place in early intervention. We couldn't quite figure out where we landed. So we developed two subgroups. The first subgroup was the service coordination identity subgroup. And that subgroup's task really was to think about how to professionalize the role of service coordination and early intervention. And what that group decided to do was think about finding a professional home for service coordinators, forming a national service coordination community of practice, and also developing a joint position statement about what service coordination is all about, how it should be supported. So I'm gonna ask Dana if you'll drop in, um, if you have a link, Dana, I probably should have thought about telling you this, but, um, or any information, if you are not part of the um, Division of Early Childhood National Service Coordination Community of Practice, you do not need to be an, a DEC member to participate. And that group has grown very quickly. I think there are over 500 service coordinators nationwide, and it just continues to grow. The other thing, and, and what that did by forming that is actually gave service coordinators a home through the Division of Early Childhood, or DEC. The other thing that that group um, worked on was a position statement. That has been... Um, a long process as well, but I'm delighted to say um, that the position statement is now approved and there is information going out. It has been approved as a joint activity between DEC and the Infant uh, Toddler Council Association, so ITGA. So big, big steps for service coordination. The second work group of our Leadership Institute group was the recommended knowledge and skills for service coordinators. And what we really worked on was how to augment existing service coordination training and competencies. Um, what we found when we looked nationally is that many states did not have any competencies for service coordination. So for many, it was a brand new starting point. Virginia actually does have service coordination competencies. And it's a little kudos to Virginia that a lot of our work was used to build those. Those have also been approved and um, are now available. And that's what we're gonna spend a little time today talking about so you all are, are aware of the work of that. So what I'd like you to do is use your stamp tool and you can um, put choose whatever stamp you want and put whether you have seen the KSSCs or if you've not seen the KSSCs. Just a reminder how to use stamp tools if you've not joined us before. Go to your ribbon that says annotate and you can choose the stamp 
you can choose whatever stamp you um, want and just you can drop it in her hand. Look, people are starting. I see a star, a check. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a minute to, to put that in right now. If you do not know how to use the stamp tool, it's okay. Feel free to use chat as well. Thanks, Maria and Helen. I see your notes. Dana, thank you. I also see that Dana has added the community of practice in chat. Angie has seen them. So take maybe another 20 seconds and either add to chat or add your stamp and I'll be watching that. Tamala says she has an Emily. Lots of people have not seen good. Stacy is seeing. Yeah, Stacy's on the know, in the know about this. All right, so kind of doing just a quick eyeball, it seems like more of you have not yet seen the knowledge, skills, and service court for service coordinators. Um, no worries about that because, again, they just got finalized, just got approved. Um, and so that's how we're going to spend our time today. If I can get my slide to advance, hang on. Oop, somebody's. All right, so I'm going to give a quick overview of the knowledge and skills. And there are six overarching themes. And those are infant and toddler development, family centered practices, leadership and teaming, coordination of services, transition, and professionalism. So when they were developed, those six big themes came out as really key um, elements of knowledge. And then we'll talk about how they're broken down a little bit. So what I'd like to ask you to do is I'm going to put up a poll in just a second. And I want you to put, uh, think about what are you most comfortable when you look at those big overarching ideas what in your role as a service coordinator do you feel most comfortable? Um, hey, Corey. Yes. It's Dana, um, your, your um, audio is going in and out just a bit. So I wonder if you might want to turn off your webcam just to eliminate the bandwidth issues. I can do that I for can, you. Or if you're comfortable, you can turn that off maybe. Sure. I'd be happy. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, I'll stop my video right now. Okay. All right, so you guys let me know, is the polling, it's working okay, and you can hear me okay now, Dana? Yep, you sound fine, and the poll is working. Great. Ooh, lots of people are voting. So if you're just joining us, you're looking at a poll and you're selecting which are you the most comfortable of the six topics that are listed um, on screen in your role as a service coordinator. I'll give you about 10 more seconds to cast your vote. All right, let's end this. All right, <clears throat> so um, what you all chose, and there were some close runners up, infant and toddler development had 49%, family-centered practice and coordination of service was 43%. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to start with the one that you're most comfortable and um, take a look at that one first. So you guys can get a flavor for how, um, how the knowledge skills for the service coordination, I'm going to keep calling them the KSSEs, are set up. So what you'll see first is the big overarching um, knowledge that people have. So I'm going to be quiet for just a second and take a look and read this one. Okay. 
Okay, so after you look at that main category, then they, the KSSCs are broken down into, we never have landed quite on the words, but like the benchmarks of how, how your knowledge is demonstrated in your work. So what I'd like you to think about is the words, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause in just a minute, but I want you to think about the words that are in this um, sort of peach color. And um, let me know if there are words that really stand out to you or um, how the group who worked on these kind of came up with these. And you can put that information in chat. I'll give you a minute to read them and then feel free to add in chat. <clears throat> Stacy notes that she really likes support families in their understanding of child development. Mm -hmm. Nanette agrees. Thanks, Nanette. H.C. Rich, sorry, I don't know your first name, but thank you for agreeing. I appreciate that. One of the things I want you all to really focus on when you think about those words, again, the idea of demonstrating, how do we know a service coordination, a service coordinator can do this knowledge and skills? So the key words of explain, apply, support families um, were chosen really purposefully. All right, so what I'd like you to do, there are some questions on screen. We're gonna take these one at a time so I can monitor the chat. But what I'd like you to type in chat is in chat is how did you as a service coordinator learn about child development? Where did you get that knowledge? Jeffrey, thank you. The whole child. Yes. Whole Jessica says same thing. And too. All right. So you're typing in chat. How did you learn about child development? Thanks, Helen. Absolutely. She says they have a large Hispanic and Haitian population and have to consider cultural differences. So people said they got experience in college. I mean, they got it through experience. They had college um, courses. Kim Kimberly says having my own children working in CPS. Raising my own kids. Ann Brager says Dr. Spock. Yes. The Virginia Indicators book. <laughs> Joanne says, Dr. Mom, nothing like that. I don't know if Dr. Mom is like a like a national kind of person or if Joanne, you're talking about your mom, but certainly I learned a lot from my mom. Training, modules, on the job, yes. Uh, uh, Millie was a resource mother. So you guys have gotten that experience from lots of different, um, different ways. So what I'd like you to do, and we're going to try to collect these so that you have a resource list at the end of our training today. What's your favorite resource regarding understanding, knowing child development? Drop that in chat. Maria says training and modules. The Child Indicator Booklet, mm -hmm. Talks on Tuesdays. So incidental, like chatting with providers, early intervention training. Training modules, supervision, webinars, great. Sydney offers zero to three great resources. The CDC Milestones. Hooks on Tuesday. Yeah, zero to three is popping up. They have such great, great stuff. 
Lisa, if you get a second, maybe you could drop zero to three um, in the chat in case people don't have that link. That would be really helpful. Milestones. All right, you guys have lots of ideas. Now, one of the things that we hear sometimes is that some service coordinators are less comfortable. They didn't have courses on child development. Is there anything that you might tell a new service, oops, that's not what I wanted to do, hang on. Um, let me go back. That you would tell a new service coordinator that's struggling really knowing about child development what ideas or tips would you give that person to help grow their knowledge and skills? Mary Lou says, uh, great resources through the Pathways Foundation. So how would you advise a new person who's struggling with Say they just started their job as a service coordinator. Shadow other service coordinators, um, the child development, uh, the CDC, the indicator booklet. Uh -huh. Jean says, takes time really listening and observing in assessments, ask questions. Yeah, shadowing is coming up a number of times. It does take time, Nanette, I completely agree. Working closely, closely with providers is a good way. I know that I um, supervise students who are getting duly licensed in early childhood and early childhood special education. And the opportunity to shadow a PT, an OT, or a speech language pathologist has been one of the most beneficial for them to really learn about child development. For my students, it typically is um, they're least comfortable about motor development. And so having time to be able to spend time with an OT or PT and ask questions um, has been a great opportunity. So thank you guys for sharing that. So let's go back and now think about Which one are you least comfortable? So hang tight. I'm going to drop a poll in and we're going to have you give your input on out of these, which are you the least comfortable of the six overarching KSSCs? Take about 20 more seconds so you can answer the poll question and then we'll move forward. Okay, let's see what our results are. So in this one, we had kind of a clear front runner. You guys selected transition as the one that you feel the least comfortable. So let's take a look at that one. I think when we think about transition, one of the, thing that, one of the things that this work group um, thought about is transition from all different kinds of activities. Sometimes we automatically jump to transition as leaving early intervention into Part B services. But this is set up exactly the same as what we just did with infant and toddler development. I'm going to pause, give you a minute to read the overarching competency, and then we'll look at those benchmark demonstrate skills. Oh, 
Okay, so let's look at how those are demonstrated. So again, we kind of highlight the red, some of the key items. So take a minute to look at those. And if you have any responses to the things that are highlighted, feel free to drop in chat your thoughts and ideas. All right, any of those demonstrate words pop out to you? Asking questions, managing timelines is difficult. We certainly hear that. Um, Julia says partnering. Jeffrey says individualized stands out is and is appropriate, appropriate and individualized because we're always programmed to start thinking about part B transitions and neglect community options. Absolutely. Amanda mentions timelines. Yep, supporting transition across settings. So again, helping to think through that idea of transition. Um, Actually, transitions happen multiple times, depending on if a child's transitioning from the NICU into early intervention, from one early intervention program to another local system. Um, Helen says, we're feeling a little better about transition. We were feeling better until the pandemic, um, but now trying to find creative ways. Yes, Helen, we have heard that too, that certainly we're having to think through this um, a lot of different a lot of different ways with this uh, pandemic, yes. Supporting a variety of planned and timely strategies. I know one of my colleagues from Kentucky who um, helped with, particularly with this one, talked about, you know, really helping early interventionists think about those planned and a variety of activities. So yeah, all right. So what I'd like you to think, you guys have certainly said this one is a little bit more of a challenge. So what's the best tip or strategy you've learned as a service coordinator to support transition? Tell me what you got. I agree, Alexis. Pandemic has definitely brought all kinds of new struggles. Kim says, Patience and flexibility, Mary Lou says, start early. Yeah, there's a reason we start talking about transition from the very beginning. Angie, looking at it as a process rather than a one-time discussion. Mm -hmm. Kavanda says, start early, discuss community options along with Part B. Nosheen has a transition work group. Oh, I'd love to hear more about that. Joanne talks about social stories. Part B allowed me to take photos of the classroom. Oh, I'd love a, a picture of that, uh, Joanne. Uh, Jeffrey sets time aside to talk about the options. Uh, Karen, talk to the family ongoing to assist with transition. And yes, yeah, some parents change their mind the closer. Yeah, it's, it's scary to think about sending your almost three-year-old or sometimes two-year-old school. Um, it's more difficult for family if you jump in too late. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Nanette. Let's see if I missed anybody else. So we have a couple ideas that, you know, if you guys are interested, um, I can follow up with Kavanda about, um, I'm sorry, with Nosheen about the transition work group, if that's something, um, and Joanne about social stories. We, that's something I could definitely. Um, Helen says one of their ECSE teachers just did a 
uh, daily uh, slideshow of the classroom and daily activities. If these are the kind of resources that would be helpful, um, then um, I will capture the chat at the end. I see Mary Lou says that would be great. I will see if we can get access and share for those of you who um, who have joined. Thanks, Alexis. I will I will work hard to do that, and um, because you all actually. Um, shared some great resources. If you have any other resources um, related to transition, feel free to keep popping those in chat. Um, I'm happy to, to try to pull this together in a document that you guys would have access to. All right, I am going to, we still have some time to look at one more. Now, one of the things um, when we did the what you are most comfortable is um, the second highest one was coordination of services. I'm going to hit on this one because it's a pretty needy knowledge and skills, pretty hefty. So let's take a look at that one. The funny thing is when you read the overarching statement, it's very short. And then when you see the demonstrate uh, benchmarks, a lot longer. So take a look at this one. All right, sounds pretty easy. Very few words. Now let's look at the benchmarks. This one is so long, you guys, it's two slides with lots of words. So I'll give you a little bit of time to look at this one first. If there's anything that pops out on this one that you want us to kind of hit on, go ahead and put that in chat. Tamala says they do a transition fair. So Tamala, we'll follow up and see if we can get more information to add to our list. Thank you. All right, anything that you guys want to hit on this one that strikes you as a demonstration kind of benchmark? Take that in chat. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slide if you're continue to think about, because again, this one has, um, oops, hang on just a second. Sometimes my mouse doesn't quite click. Okay, so here's the rest of that one. All right, so when you think about all those demonstration things, again, this is the um, probably the heftiest knowledge and skills, the coordination of services. Um, so I want you to think about, did, did we hit everything? Is there anything that you see that's missing when you think about the, your role as the service coordinator coordinating those services? Um, Stacy says she's noticed the functional outcomes um, Nanette says she's been doing this for 15 years and always something to learn. Oh, yep, we can always learn new resources.
All right, let's go to our questions for this one then. So when you think about what's the most part, the most challenging part of coordinating services in your role, type that in chat for me. Uh, Nanette says, functional assessment training I just had was great. Uh, Nanette, if you can tell us if that was something through our uh, PD, Virgin VEI PD, or where you went to that, if that was something that somebody else did, type that in chat for us. Angelina says, what's challenging for her is providing service coordination only for families. So Angelina, do you mean that they're not getting other services, just service coordination? Yeah, lots of comments about trying to make connections with families during COVID. Um, Millie, talk a little bit more when parents are in denial. Tell me what you mean about that. Difficulty keeping contact with parents. Kavanda likes the word partner. And HC risk while Millie's doing what parents do not agree. Tell me what they're not agreeing about. Angelina does clarify, yes, yeah, service coordination only uh, continuing that rapport and getting updates when, um, right, when you're, when they're not getting other services. Alexis is struggling during COVID with teletherapy. Um, many seem uninterested in virtual, so she's been having trouble getting a hold of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, HC Rich says one parent wants, wants a school referral and the other does not. Yeah, that's tricky when you're stuck in the middle of that kind of discussion. Add, um, Joanne adds that when two parents have different opinions about their child's need, you know, I tell this story all the time. Um, I've been teaching for a very long time at JMU. And one time when um, my youngest was little, I brought her in for my students to assess. But I had my husband come in as the parent. And so I'm supposed to be there in the professor or teacher role. And my husband's answering all the questions wrong. And I'm like, what are you thinking? She can do that or she doesn't do that. It's difficult when you have those two different opinions. Um, Nanette says it was a five path training. Let's see. Nanette, I'm pretty sure that's the functional assessment learning path. Um, we can drop that in if you are, if you guys are interested in functional assessment, you can drop that in. Lisa, Lisa's on it. Lisa, just drop that in if you're interested in the new learning path on functional assessment. Um, see. I have to tell you guys, so many things are popping in. I'm having trouble keeping up, but you guys are doing a, um, a great job. Let's see. Keeping rapport. Part B is more inconsistent with meetings due to COVID. Yep. Um, Millie answered my question when a child is showing developmental delays and the parent has the idea he will talk when he's ready or walk when he's ready. Um, so one thing I, I want to think about is maybe not in denial, but maybe in a different place in their understanding about their child's development and their ability to accept what's happening. So yeah, thanks Millie for sharing that. Yeah, the idea of two parents with separate opinions is coming up lots and lots. Um, <laughs> the net says I'm a bit older these days and it takes longer to locate. That's why I have backup. I can't manage all of this at one time. So, um, oh, Jean says managing the fee agreements for some families can be challenging. Okay. Let's see. All right. I think I got most of your comments. So we've had lots of different ideas about what you find is challenging. What I want you to again type in, because we're going to try to collect resources for you all, are there any great resources? So think about when parents disagree, any resources about fee agreements, um, challenges with 
COVID and Part B, we talked about assessments. Um, so type if you have any great resources you want to be sure and share with your colleagues on the call today. All right, let's see. HC Risk says transition handouts are very helpful. If you guys have not had the opportunity to look on Virginia Early Intervention Professional Development site, um, there are lots of resources for transition. We could add that to our resource list. Um, Nanette says one thing that impacts family, um, it, that if they have a fee or family cost share, they feel that it's wrong if having to do any therapy virtually. So pander, pan, uh, parents understanding of uh, tele-intervention and fees. Okay, that's good for us to know. Thanks, Nanette. All right, we have time to hit one more um, to just make sure you guys are um, Oriented, that didn't take me where it was supposed to. Hang on just a second. All right, what I'd like you to do, um, the last one that you wanna take a look, we won't have time to cover all six of these. We've hit infant and toddler development, coordination of services and transition. Go ahead and drop your stamp in one of the other ones that you wanna take a quick look before we wrap up for today. So drop your stamp. Anne is noticing there, I mean, is mentioning there'll be a couple new resources included in November's Part C update on helping families prepare for tele-intervention. Thanks, Anne. And that will come out, does that usually come out early in November, middle of November? If you can just add that to chat. And if anybody's having difficult using their stamp feature, you can go ahead um, and also put it in chat. I'll try to monitor. Anne says the Part C update will come first day of the month. Thanks, Karen. I see lots of people are voting for family centered. I'll give you guys one more couple seconds to drop your stamp or put it in chat. HC Rich, Family Centered, Family Centered. All right, we have a winner, you guys, Family Centered. Let's take a look at this one. Ooh. All right. I'm gonna give you a second again to look at this one and then we'll look at the demonstrate. All right, let's look at demonstrate. Same spiel, any words that really pop out at you, go ahead and drop those in chat and we can talk about those. Joanne likes unique qualities. Angelina says, and Jessica recognizing implicit biases. 
achieve goals, respect, respect, unique qualities, family capacity building. Yeah, lots of very strong words were chosen for this one. I will share with you all too, when we talked about the recognized implicit, implicit biases, um, that really was something that we had felt very strongly. And if you look at this document, again, that you got, there's actually even a statement about how this matches um, with the Division of Early Childhood and their, their statement on biases, their statement on, on equity, justice, their priority agenda. Um, so again, gives us sort of this national perspective um, of how this group from all over the United States really um, kind of came up with these. Um, thanks, Kavanda. Stacy likes promoting engagement. Okay, so I'm going to check and see last time so that we can see when you think about what's the best tip you've ever had about family-centered practices, something you might have learned from experience, you learn from um, a colleague, you experienced it. I'll share with you what mine was. So I started an early intervention a very long time ago. And my mentor said, the best thing you can do is lower your ego. Don't go in thinking you are the most knowledgeable, that you have more expertise than the parent. And that has been, you guys, 28 years. And I can still hear her saying, probably my first day on the job, lower your ego. That's what I tell everybody. So tell me what your tip is. What the ask caregiver what they have seen and what they expect, listening about what parents want. Never assume, Gene, you use it and go for it. Meet families where they are, not where we would like them to be. Yes, thanks, Jessica. Open minded. Don't take anything personal. Don't try to finish their sentence. Yes. Empathy, gosh, how far empathy takes us, open to listening. You know, I, I think one of the things as we've all been working on coaching is really that pause of not thinking, okay, how do I answer that? But really sitting and listening and feeling and um, giving parents time to express themselves. Joanne says, coaching, open-ended questions, let them talk. Don't judge, yes. You know, Angelina, again, another thing when I'm teaching, I talk about putting your J away. Put your J away and, and that's judgmental. So when I have a student who's talking about a situation that felt very different from what they anticipated, I'm like, I want you to pause and put your J away and try to tell me that story again or what you're what your question or concern is. Cultural awareness, uh, let's see. Don't assume you know how they feel. Kavanda says she's had personal experience when educating her son with a disability. When you experience firsthand mistreatment, you're really mindful of families in the same position, yes. Repeat back, repeat back and reflect back, yes. All right, you guys have done, had lots of good things we can, um, we can grab, so. Yes, thank you, Kavanda. Lisa says, thank you for sharing that insight. Alexis says, backing up parents when they're advocating, advocating for their child and services and tell them their emotions and feelings are valid. Yes, such great, great tips and suggestions. I am going to kind of wrap up our show and tell of the um, KSSCs. If you have a great resource again about how you learned about family-centered practices, um, 
a go-to place or if you were helping train a new service coordinators, feel free to um, drop that in. Lisa has also dropped in, excuse me, just a minute. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, our social media links um, in chat. If you're not following us, we encourage you. We have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and a YouTube chat channels, lots of opportunities for you to um, get little tidbits, little nuggets, lots of, of our resources. So feel free to join us. Um, and again, as I go to this last one, if you have any other resources about family-centered practices, go ahead and add those in chat and um, we'll gather those as well. So when you think about Many of you started this uh, webinar today not knowing very much about the new knowledge and skills for service coordinators. And now you know. So I want you to think about, so now that you know, what are you gonna do with this information? Maybe you have something to think about on a personal level that you want to um, do something. Maybe you're a supervisor, a local system manager. So I want you to pause for a second and think about that and I wanna get some ideas from you. What are you gonna do with the knowledge and skills? Stacy is going to share with staff and consider how it can help to drive each person's professional development goals. Love that from a supervisory kind of how can this be a staff as well as a personal thing. Jan's going to look at some of the resources that were mentioned today. And so is AC Rich. Amanda, more listening and less talking. See, I think those kind of nuggets, if you take away from something, some professional development opportunity, one nugget like that, boom, how pow powerful is that? Love it, Amanda. And that's going to help her think how to be a better service coordinator. Check out the resources. Uh, Stacy says, I think you were going to post today's presentation. Mm -hmm. Um. Actually, I don't know that, Stacy. I know we're recording that. So Lisa and Dana, help me about that's going to be on YouTube. Help me answer Stacy's question. Um, Jessica says, I think there's a great, great way to support and guide training. Lisa says, yes, Stacy. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. Um, so we'll get that. It will be on the, the VEIPD videos on YouTube. We're going to get that for you guys. Yes, Nanette, we are going to collect all of these resources in a list and we, it will be emailed to you. Uh, and says, great resources. Kavanda is going to re review them again in, in its entirety and put them into practice. Love that. So I wanted to share one thing, but I also want to give a little caveat. We are actually, remember I started this with that National Service Coordination Institute group, well, back when I was telling you the story of how we got there. We are actually going to do a very similar um, through the Division of Early Childhood Service Coordination Community of Practice that Dana had posted the link. It will be in your resource list too. But we are going to be doing that on, I should have had that written down, I believe it's December 3rd. Yes, December 3rd from 3 to 4 Eastern time. I want to be sure you guys know that much of the content will be just like what we did today. But a little sneak peek is that one of the things that our group is developing is like a self-assessment tool, really quick one pager. Here are the six knowledge and skills. Here are the demonstrates. And then a person can 
like rate themselves, like help, I need lots of help. I'm feeling pretty confident. So it's a quick self-assessment. If you are interested, you are welcome to join us. Um, it is not ready yet, which is why I have, I'm not sharing it with you. Um, when it is ready, don't feel like you have to join that. Um, the, Dana just put the uh, webinar um, information. You don't have to join that. It will be posted on our VEIPD. But if you would like to join that, or if you've gotten lots of good information, and want to send other colleagues to that. It's another opportunity here, something pretty similar. So again, December 3rd from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Remember, you do not have to be a DEC member to join this Community of Practice webinar and the link will be on the resource list we put together. It's also in chat. So I am going to take the opportunity to wrap up. One thing we've been asked, Ann Breger from the Part C office is, um, has recently taken over the Part C update that goes out at the beginning of each month. If you are not getting that, or if you're interested, Anne is trying to really clean up her list to make sure it's getting out to people. If you can type your name in chat, we will get that list. So I'm sorry, not your name, your name and your email um, in chat. We will grab that and be sure that Anne gets that list. Um, This is the funniest thing, you guys. I just got a pop-up that says I'm going to a breakout room. No, I'm not. I don't know where that is. So, um, all right. I'm going to give you guys just a couple seconds. Name and email if you want the Part C update and might not be getting it. Heather, now I know your name. I don't have to call you H.C. Rich. <laughs> and you're getting lots of people, lots of people. You guys have time. It's okay. We'll leave that chat um, open and you can keep putting that information. Again, as a follow-up, we'll put all the re these resources. You will get that. As Dana and Lisa helped me, this recorded um, webinar will be on our YouTube channel and we will include that link as well. So I um, want to thank you all for joining us um, for our fall SC chat. We are planning to continue to do SC chats in 2021. If anybody has a topic, feel free to put that in chat. We're looking at what those topics are gonna to be for the January one. So if you have an idea, ooh, I wish they would talk about X, Y, Z, type it in chat, we'll grab that. As a reminder, as soon as this is over, you will receive an email with a link to our survey. And when you complete that survey, you'll get your certificate of completion for our, our SC chat today. So we have about, three minutes left. I appreciate you all joining us. I will leave chat open in case we've missed anything, if you want to add your email, or if you have topics for SC Chats. And I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks so much.